Ephemeral, effervescent, enigmatic, rebellious, provocative, illegal. This is the frontier of New York City's subway graffiti. What originally started as indecipherable scrawls on the walls quickly evolved into a highly sophisticated calligraphy, flowing in constantly changing curves in bold and brilliant colors, a dynamic art show speeding along the tracks. In the late 1960s and into the early 70s, New York City was amidst an urban crisis. Decaying infrastructure, traffic, pollution, unemployment, delinquency, protests, crime, riots, drugs, and gangs. At the heart of the city was its sprawling subway system, connecting the boroughs of the Bronx, Manhattan, Brooklyn, and Queens. More than 700 miles of track, 475 subway stations, 12 storage yards, hundreds of layup sites, and a rolling stock of nearly 7,000 subway cars, the targets of the crime. So who were these vandals, or rioters as they more accurately called themselves? They were all young, between the ages of 10 and 20, mostly male, although some girls did break the status quo. And lastly, diverse. Writers were from every possible socioeconomic background, but all found common ground through the importance of a name, claiming a public identity either by their given name and street number, Taki 183, Tracy 168, Barbara and Eva 62, or more likely one of their own creations, Blade, Scene, Dondi, Zephyr, Futura, Is the Wiz, Phase 2, Kays 2, and Kane 1. From the beginning, spreading the name was the aim of the game. Throughout the 1970s, graffiti evolved to keep up with the increasing number of writers. Innovations in scale and form appeared. First came the tags, simple and quickly written, stylized names. Then throw-ups, quick outlines on the outsides, the fastest and easiest way to get up. Pieces were short for masterpieces, gradually increasing in size. Window downs, top to bottoms, end to ends, whole cars 60 feet long, and finally the whole train of 10 to 11 cars. With larger scale came more room for style, bubble, blockbuster, wild style, just to name a few of the many. Marks of good style were originality of design, flow of the letters, smoothness of application, accuracy of outlines, brightness of color, and effective use of details the lines, swirls, arrows, stars, and characters. Surrounding this vibrant culture was a tight-knit community built upon shared experiences. Writers' benches emerged, places where peace books were autographed and outlines traded. Along with this came the development of writing crews and an apprenticeship system in which novices were mentored by the more experienced. Graffiti was a lifestyle, developing an entirely new youth subculture with its own influence of popular culture, folklore of early pioneers and legendary achievements, and an entire lexicon of slang, where tagging, bombing, burning, and biting meant actions, and nasty, vicious, bad, and dirty were terms of approval. Writers were often deserving of this praise, for they faced many obstacles in pursuit of their goal. They worked in darkness, surrounded by dangerous machinery, live third rails, and the unexpected incoming train or balanced on the cross ties of elevated tracks high above the street, ready at any moment to dash in case of a police raid. In addition to such perils, they endured their parents' wrath at home and the attacks of hostile rivals in the streets. So why were these hopefuls so ready to risk their lives? Well, many craved the adventure, seeing themselves as outlaws, traversing across the unknown, seeking to write in the most unexpected or inaccessible locations, and embracing the dangers with excitement and enthusiasm. Most sought fame, the desire for status and recognition among their peers for their skills, ingenuity, and courage. It was a competition to see who could get up the most and become king of the line. Others were in it solely for the artistic merit and freedom of self-expression. Writers wanted to create something positive to light up their dreary surroundings. They used graffiti as an opportunity to project their imaginations, dreams, and aspirations. 
Some even pursued a more practical purpose, using the subways as a form of mass communication for personal dedications, holiday greetings, and political activism. Eventually, graffiti became scrutinized in the media and by the authorities. The MTA and New York Times saw graffiti as a dangerous and subversive threat to local authority, characterizing it as a blight, a plague, and an epidemic, and painting writers as malicious, crazed youths with feeble minds. While many associated graffiti with increased crime, writing actually helped to keep young people away from gang violence and drug abuse. The real issue was its contributions to the prevailing sense of the incapacity of government, the uncontrollability of youth criminal behavior, and the resultant uneasiness and fear. Writing symbolized a city out of control, a breakdown of law and order that drove riders away from the subways and costed the city millions of dollars per year to remove. I despise the people. I uh, think it's a lot of junk. Just the to look at it. Very, very, very bad. Built. Absolute built. Destruction. In 1972, Mayor John Lindsay declared the first war on graffiti. His prevention strategies included using chemical solvents to buff or remove the writing, restricting access to paints, increasing security measures, forming an anti-graffiti task force, and distributing punishments to fit the crime. In the second war on graffiti of the early 1980s, Mayor Ed Koch shifted the strategy to the threat of razor wire fences and patrol dogs and the appeal of celebrity advertising. By 1989, the trains were officially declared graffiti free. Amidst all this hostility, graffiti writers still found ways to adapt even thriving within their new circumstances. Groups of skilled writers like the United Graffiti Artists gathered to paint pieces on canvas and then presented their works in gallery shows. The rapid spread of graffiti within the modern art world significantly influenced the development of pop artists like Keith Haring and John michel Basquiat, who further legitimized the artistic value of graffiti for a more mainstream audience. As hip-hop began to gain market success and take shape as a new commercial music genre, it turned to writing as this recognizable iconic design. Graffiti appeared in music videos as well as on album covers and stage backdrops. By turning itself into a valued popular culture commodity, graffiti became more acceptable to the guardians of public and private property. Yet conflict within the writing community emerged. The writing that was alive on the trains seemed tamed and static on the gallery walls and hip hop backgrounds. Many felt that removing graffiti from the trains and producing it legally took away from its essence, its definition as a symbol for rebelling against the establishment. From all these changes arose a new movement, the street art movement. Writers began bombing the streets, writing on highway walls and bridges, rooftops, and abandoned buildings. The move to the walls was a logical extension of the trend toward larger, more pictorial and mural-like compositions. Others turned to commercial freight trains, which were the closest things to the subways, and traveled not just across the city, but across the continent, spreading graffiti throughout the United States and all the way to the West Coast. Further, the circulation of writers' zines and online videos ultimately led to the globalization of writing. International graffiti exploded during the 1990s. England, France, Switzerland, Germany, Greece, and Australia. Once considered an illegal art form, graffiti is now celebrated and practiced worldwide in museums, advertising, fashion, and the internet. As a frontier, New York City subway graffiti brought up the questions of ownership, art, and acceptability. Subway graffiti not only altered the city's environment, but left its mark on the consciousness of millions of subway riders. Pioneers within graffiti faced physical dangers, parental objections, police threats, and court punishments, but remained steadfast in their convictions, constantly developing their styles and quickly adapting to new situations. Rarely had a spontaneous group activity flourished for so long and on such a scale in the face of persistent attempts to wipe it out. Graffiti's widespread influence and longevity within the present day is a testament to its value as an art form 
universal subculture and catalyst of unconventional expression.